we're recording. You're listening to the Tune Up and Jam podcast. Ready? Go. Go, 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 go. This is episode seven, Tune Up and Jam. All right, tune up, turn up, get down and start jamming once again. Hello and buongiorno. It's the Tune Up and Jam podcast, episode number seven. We are coming from Altadena Sound Studios in Altadena, California. My name is Rich, part of the Diggum crew. Right to my left is Chris. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. <laughs> Reminds me of like a spaghetti commercial. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I had some SpaghettiOs earlier today, man. Yeah, right. Yeah, we opened up the can and had me some SpaghettiOs. Hey, buongiorno, Francito. SpaghettiOs. Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> we um we had a little bit of a hiatus again. We had some Francis was hooking up some some good uh, podcast guests. I guess we had like a. Paul Simon was um, lined up here. The cast from um, Wicked and um, <laughs> and Glee and Glee, but um, then Francis decided it was going to be parent date night tonight. So we have no guests tonight. It's just <laughs> it's us. Just the parents. Just <laughs> us. <laughs> just us. Just the crew. So here we are tonight. So what are we going to talk about, Francis? I don't know. What do you want to talk about? We. All right, you got about, this okay. has really nothing to do with you know our, our typical spiel, but I noticed that it rained today, mm-hmm. and we're in LA, and we've ha- this is episode seven. We've already had. <laughs> I'm nerding out. <laughs> this is really stupid, but we've already had two <laughs> podcasts on days when it rained out of seven in LA. How weird is that? Well, is yeah, that stupid? I, I, mean, I, well, I don't like, think it's rained more than two days in the last year. <laughs> I know, I know, so two of those that's, that's pretty amazing that we got two of them there. Am I just being stupidly like... Um, well, observant? you started the show with Bongiorno, <laughs> so uh, I think... <laughs> Makes me concerned what's on the future podcast. Okay, here's what bothers me. Okay, I grew up in sunny Pennsylvania. <clears throat> I say that with no hyperbole whatsoever. And, um, you know, it probably rained five out of seven days a week, you know? And... My windshield wipers would last for about nine years, and here it rains what three days every two, three days every like two or three years, and I got to change my windshield wipers yeah. every year. The I sun mean, cracks I, them up, I, breaks I, them up. Don't get all scientific on me. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. I don't use them as much, but I got to change them more often. They suck. All right, I, stop whining. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> So let's get on to uh, the connecting, educating, and promoting young musicians, music makers, and music supporters, Francis. <laughs> hey, that's what we do. Hey, why don't we talk about cover bands? That sounds like a good idea. Cover bands. Cover bands. Cover, cover bands. Wait, cover bands or tribute bands? Cover bands. Well, you know, that's that's a good point because I think there should be a distinction. I mean, at least in my, my perception, there's a difference. Um, I look at cover bands as... Bands that play a variety of covers, a variety of music, and the, I don't what's the word, the, the purity of the execution can vary. You know, tribute bands to me, they're basically bringing the experience, the, the vibe, the look, the sound, as close as possible to the original. I would agree. I think, you know, your, your typical cover band could cover anything from uh, Baby Got Back from Sir Mix-A-Lot <laughs> to, you know playing uh lead boots by jeff beck and with like you said some maybe discrepancy to the original in the same set in the same set versus a tribute band which you know may have somebody who's actually playing the eddie van halen kramer is it a kramer guitar with the crazy stuff i I, I think you're you're stuck on the uh you're stuck way back, way back. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying a trip. Uh, you know, there are now, actually. You know what? Now that you're, you're really referring to the, the, the good era of Van. Halen. The Van Halen, you know, the, the Van. Halen, but you but know, that would be the tribute. You've that seen the, the tribute. tribute you know, they're they're yeah. dressing like them. Yeah. They're talking like them. Uh, they're doing the songs exactly like them uh, for that kind of experience. And and uh, those bands um, are becoming more and more prevalent. It seems like to me. Yeah, it does. Yeah, but why? I mean, is it because a lot of these bands are maybe finished or kind of on their last legs and 
it on the could way be. out, and 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 people, I mean, people maybe missed or miss what they once saw and and want to relive it or something. Like, why is it? I think that's that always a possibility. Tribute bands yeah. are so so popular. I mean, I've seen. I mean, some of them I've seen. They're really good too. I, I saw yeah. a Van Halen one. I mean, they were they were spot on. I mean, mm-hmm. from from the drumming to the the guitars to the lead singer doing David Lee Roth. It was all David Dave era. Mm-hmm. Early day there, and I mean they were spot on. I mean they were good, and it does it pumps you up like you're. I mean you know you're not at that concert, but for, you know you that 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 you know ten percent of what it feels like of the actual show, you get pretty pumped up for that for that night, and it's yeah. And but, for a, it's much more accessible. Number yeah. one, two, it's much more affordable, uh, and three, and I don't want to say many cases, but in some cases. Uh, they're better than the original. You know, I mean, the, the tribute band has almost overtaken in some cases, and, and I hate to use this as an example, but if you've seen the Rolling Stones lately, yeah. uh, it it's a little bit disappointing. And I haven't seen them live, but, you know, I can't imagine spending two, 300 bucks to see the Rolling Stones and for the product that they might put out now where I could see a Rolling Stones tribute band who is pretty fantastic. <laughs> And uh, but would you? I mean, would you still like? Well, not the Rolling Stones because I'm not that into them. But uh, you know, okay. Well, let's say like you know. Like okay, a, let's let's give an example yeah. of like let's say I've heard that there is a Beastie Boys tribute band. Okay. Obviously, the Beastie Boys. We're not going to see the Beastie Boys uh, play live again. Uh, would I be interested in seeing a Beastie Boys tribute band? Hell yes, I would love to see a Beastie but Boys gotta, tribute. They got to pull that off. They well, have just to like pull any... it off. But but you know if 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 they're at that point. And I'm going to watch with a pretty critical eye, yeah. obviously, as I think any real fan would of yeah. any band. Yeah. Uh, that would be pretty amazing for me to go see. So I, I'm assuming for whether it's The Who or The Grateful Dead or Van Halen um, or Led Zeppelin or you know some of these bands that, that uh, maybe you're not going to see ever again. Or if you do, it's a geriatric version of it. Um, it's a pretty cool experience. It's a pretty cool experience. And I got to think that if you're going to be in that tribute band, I mean, that's 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 not just like you happen to be in that band. You happen to join up with a band. And I mean, that's a goal. You, If you're going to do a Beastie Boys tribute band, I mean, you are a diehard fan of that band. Or you're, you know? or, or you're uber talented. You know, there, there's also the reality that, that tribute bands, when they get to that point, you know, can make a decent amount of money Mm-hmm. compared to a regular cover band playing in a bar. Usually you're playing at a bigger venue or a festival or something of that nature to bring that experience. And so instead of making your 100 bucks a night, or maybe, maybe you're making more money. I, I don't know. I've never been in a tribute band. Have, have either of you guys been in a tribute band? I know. No. no. But, but also, yeah, I do think But that's the difference. You're bringing the experience as opposed to in a cover band, you know, you're playing a familiar song. You know, for whatever it be. I mean, so going back to the cover band situation, I mean, that's really the core difference that I see. And being in a cover band, you, I think you have some leeway in interpreting the songs. You know, you don't have to do note for note necessarily as long as you're getting the the vibe of the song or, you know, I say the key phrases that makes it familiar, makes it enjoyable for whoever's listening. Absolutely, and I think even even famous bands. There's been many. There have been many famous bands who have done cover albums. You know where they where they cover a, a number of different artists uh, in their album, but put their own spin on it. I can think of you know Metallica did a, a did a cover. Uh, oh, they've album. actually done a lot of, lots of covers. A lot yeah. of covers, but yeah. I think they yeah. did a whole Couple cover album. Also. Yeah, they did two of them. And the Garage Days. And Rage uh, Against the Machine. They did a cover up. Yeah, I did not know that. They did. I think of Bob Seger, OPS, which was to me is was an excellent Bob Seger album, and uh, he did all covers. Little, I'm sorry, little Detroit Rock City shout mm-hmm. out there. <laughs> but um, so for if there's any young musicians listening, and you know, depending on um, you know what their goals are, I think there could be a group of them that you know think, well, I don't want to be in a cover band. You know, I want to you know do original music. I want to play my music. Which is all well and good, and I totally support that, and, I, and I'm really into that as well. But I do think there's some advantages or perks to um, starting, or I should say, opening your mind to to participating. I guess in the cover band, it's not like it could be your be all end all. 
as but opposed to a tribute tribute band. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to a tribute band. I mean, tribute band. I think you know, as uh, Schmoke was saying, you kind of got to be all in, or you were saying, you got to be all in, you know, to bring that experience. But in a cover band, you know, playing a variety of songs, you know, there's there's different uh, opportunities. I think. Well, and I think also, especially, uh, I shouldn't even say especially for young musicians, but it gives you an opportunity to play different styles, uh, to open your mind to different different things that maybe you wouldn't have before. And also, you know, to, to be honest, versus maybe an original band, uh, it gives you an opportunity to maybe make some money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and you're in your, your, in your, in the long run, you're going to be more marketable. Yeah. To, you know, uh, whoever else in the future, you know, whenever you, you have kind of a, a bank full of different songs, different types of songs, different styles, like you were talking about, people are going to, you know, probably be a lot more open to, to having you on. Well, you know, and or, or doing an emergency gig, you mean, you know. and there have been a a, a a lot of very famous bands that have started as cover bands, or as at least partially cover bands. Well, I think when you're starting out, you don't have enough original material to justify a full set or a few sets. And if you're doing, you know, if you're playing in a bar gig and you're at least required to do, you know, anywhere from three to four sets, you're going to fill that up with naturally the the songs that you've that you want to play on the, uh, from covers that you've learned um, when you started the instrument. Yeah. So I'm interested to ask you guys a question. Um, in being in a cover band, uh, which all of us have been in a cover band, and we've played covers together, and we've played covers apart and everything else, where do you think they'll, where do you draw the line on what covers you will play? Where <laughs> do you draw the line at some point of like, I will absolutely not play... I'm not even going to mention a song because I don't want to <laughs> offend it, anybody. <laughs> uh, but I will absolutely not play this song. Um, I mean, by choice, because there's also don't forget there's also the factor of oh, can I play this song? Right, right. There you go. There's yeah, you, you have that thrown in too. I, I think we've been in this situation before, though, haven't we? When a, th- a song's been thrown out there, and one or two of us have said absolutely not, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, and I think it depends on the si- situation and group of musicians. Uh, like for example, I mean, cover bands have different opportunities for gigs, and if you're like for example playing the bar gig, all right, you know you have a little leeway for your choice, your set list, but there's also uh, opportunities if you're going to play weddings, for example, you know, and those of us you know who have played weddings know if the wedding party is going to present you know their list, or I should say, uh, filter your list. You know, you have to go with what the program is. And as a paid musician, you know, this is the job at the moment, you so, know. So I, I, I had a, uh, a interesting conversation with a piano player recently, and we were talking about uh, playing a particular cover song, and his first declaration was, I would never, ever, ever play that song. And I said, well, what if the gig played a thousand bucks? And he said, I would absolutely play that song. <laughs> Money talks. I, right? I, I've, I've done songs I absolutely do not like for fractions. <laughs> yeah. fractions. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know. I mean, like, there's always that price, right? Money talks. But I mean, there, I can definitely think of some times or some songs that I would be really, really opposed to playing. Um, for whatever reason, it could even just be something that goes back to when I was a teenager and that song just, I hated it so much that I will never, ever, never, you know, choose without a fight to, to, to play that song as a cover. I will fight as much as I can to not play it. Right, for whatever reason, I don't know what the reason can, would be. Can we do an interesting thing here? What? Just at, at risk of offending songwriters everywhere. <laughs> what is that one song for you? What is Mine, that one song for you? I can say the the, the first thing that top that goes to the top of my head would be some Bon Jovi song, <laughs> like yeah. um, um, "You Give Love a Bad Name" or something like that. Like I know there's plenty of people that like it, but I will not, not play that song without a fight. Like, I was shot through the heart, like, and you're to blame. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I mean, like it doesn't it doesn't kill me like it used to when I was younger. I hated that song. I did not like the band. And I'm sorry, John Bon Jovi. I know you're you're planning on coming in here, but we can make it up some <laughs> other way. Not anymore. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I don't. But I mean, that's the one that just pops in my head, and that's the only reason that I can say is because when I was a kid, it was just not cool 
to me and my and what I was into at that time, you know. Yeah, I don't, for me it's not one particular song, but disco songs are yeah, I yeah, or I should say, well, I should, well, here's the thing: playing disco songs like true to the the yeah. format, I should say, for example, because I give you an example of um, what's the song? Um, I will survive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. You know, it's it's not something I'm particularly into, but I think uh, what is it? Was it Cake that did a version? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Version? Okay. You know, that's a twist on it, and and sure, that's you know a, a different approach. But if you were to ask me if we're going to sit around, you know, if it's going to be a democratic process and say, hey, why don't we play I Will Survive? I'd probably oppose that. Mm. Chris? You know, I, it's funny. Be, and, and I've played a lot of cover songs. Uh, and there's nothing that jumps out that I would say absolutely not um, if we're getting paid. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean. I, I yeah, think for the record, yeah, that's the. I think I think I have that 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 uh, that limit going where 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 I feel like in my in my mind where I'm going. Well, if we're getting paid, I'll, I'll pretty much do anything. Like you know, I'll dress up like a clown and and. There, there are songs that I play that we play now. Yeah, as, as covers that. I mean, I gotta say, I really don't like playing them. They just bore the heck out of me. You know what I mean? Like. As, you know, there are some drum parts out there that are just completely, I mean, you can't, you can't make them more interesting. It would ruin the song, really. Yeah, you know, yeah. but so you just back there keeping this time. And I got to say a lot of, there've been several Beatles songs that are like that too. You're yeah. just like bored, you know? And then like it goes on, but what are you going to do? You know what I mean? Like, uh, well, it's, it's like, it's like play, playing it some country on the bass. You got to remember. Yeah. You are. You know, yeah, where, exactly. Where even if the song has some merit and is very popular, um, the bass lines are yeah. boring to play. But that's the whole but part. But it's part of the gig, though. It's yeah, part of the well, gig. And that's the whole part. I mean, you're getting paid, so it is a job in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. And so sometimes for your job, you're not going to like every minute of and it. And that's right? a great and discussion to jump into about playing <clears throat> cover song, or really about being paid. Yeah. You know, the difference between being a paid musician and being a you know, one-set showcase band. Mm-hmm. Um, but even to that sense of being, what responsibility do musicians have to the venue that they're playing at? You know, what, 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 uh, should they be able to expect from musicians and what should musicians be able to expect, expect from the venue, um, coming back to it? I don't well, know. Well, I, I think, you know, in, in some of the experiences we've had, we've, we've had some flexibility, and also there have been some guidance, mm-hmm. you know, but that's pretty wide open and it's, you know, subject to interpretation, trusting you'll choose the right song and trusting that the venue will be accepting of that, you know, but there, I think it's a good thing to mention um, about having the professionalism as a working musician to step up and let's just say execute or perform the song as best you can without it being, you know, kind of like, all right, I'm not into this song. I'm just going to lay back and uh, just kind of, you know what I mean? Muddle through this song. I mean, just to get it over with. So I think there's some, you know, professional responsibility just for the integrity of, of the moment for you. Well, and that's the, the nuts and bolts, I think of, of understanding when you play for money. Um, and even sometimes when you're playing just for opportunity, um, is do you have an intrinsic responsibility to the venue that you're playing at? And I would say, yes, you do. You know, I mean, they're a for-profit industry. You know, bars are a for-profit industry. So people that are there, that are staying and buying drinks, uh, regardless of what you're playing, is really all the bar cares about. They don't care what you're playing. Uh, they don't care how loud you are if people stay and buy drinks drinks don't chase anybody out right right keeping people in the place and i and that's a tough thing as an artist sometimes to to accept uh because maybe your artistic integrity you feel at times might be compromised uh so it's something it's 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 definitely a reconciliation that everybody has to look at if they want to go play in in front of people totally we, we all go into this like going 
I'm going to get myself out there. I'm going to do my thing, you know, and right. you have that pride that you're not going to do this or play that. But you, you're right. You you have to kind of do a little bit of self-checking. If, if you want to get jobs, if you want to work out there, if you want to play, you got to do a little bit of, all right, this is what I need to do. This is what the, what the place wants me to do. I, I got to swallow a little bit of pride here and, and, and do this. But I think, too, um, I can recall, I mean, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but really 99% to almost 100% of the gigs, like the bar gigs that we have done, there's always a patron making a request. Hey, you know, hey, can you guys do this? Can you guys play this song? Play this band? Or, all right, if you can't play a particular song, can you play anything from the band or the genre? There's Same always, genre. always doing that. And I think, I mean, it's great, and that's one of the, the things about being in a cover band. It tests your versatility. It tests your musicianship. Um, you know, maybe you will try your best at something that you haven't done before, but, you know, it's it's going to help you progress as a musician. But I think, you know, in the beginning, keeping that open mind enough to do that, you know, without it, no, I don't play this or, you know, I don't play that. I think it's important for for a lot of the younger musicians to realize that, you know what, learn a lot of cover songs. Mm-hmm. Be willing to play those cover songs, you know. Yeah, you want to get your own music out there. Yeah, you want to play it and everything like that. But really, nobody knows who you are just yet. And and one of the ways to really just pull people in is to be a really, if you play some covers really well, Yeah. and especially if you want to be artsy about it, change, it, change up the yeah. cover, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Put your own little spin on it and people will enjoy that and they'll be attracted to that and then throw your originals or whatever you want at them. But, you know, the the I mean... I've been through it several times with several bands where we're just like not playing any covers and you, it's really, really difficult. Yeah. Really difficult. Well, and we've talked about um, the advantage of, you know, I guess, expanding your musicality, your you know, musicianship, but also there's the um, um, advantage of networking. You know, you're out there, you're meeting other musicians and the live experience. I mean, there's a lot of bars and or you know other venues that if they want if they have a a regular live music um, schedule they're going to want musicians to play and you know you may not be a very seasoned player but you have an opportunity right there to gain experience you know with those types of gigs with cover gigs yeah yeah i think uh, i think if 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 you look at gigs as not only an opportunity to maybe make a little money uh but more so as an opportunity to gain experience. You know, if you go in and it is a quote unquote lame gig for one reason or the other, the crowd's unresponsive or there's not a big crowd, but you can learn something out of it. Maybe you learn a new song, maybe you hear something, maybe you have that one, you know, magic moment. You know, as musicians, you talk about on stage, sometimes you have those magic moments, then it's worth it. Or, or you have a train wreck and you learn yeah. what not to do. Right, not to mention something could go wrong, sound could yeah. screw up, or you know whatever happens, and hey, you got to deal with it. You got to work through it. And if there's two people in the place, or you know, fifty people in the place, or five hundred people in the place, you got to deal with it in the same way. So you can always learn something when you're playing out live. Well, you never know. Also, there might be two people in the place, but maybe one of those two people is looking to book for a festival That's right. or has a corporate gig yep. or a big wedding that you can make some money at or, you know, any number of things, whatever you're into, um, you just you just don't know. And I think Or that, has a cousin who's a musician, an incredible musician, who's looking for a band to play and yeah. it happens to be... Yeah, you, yeah. you just don't know. Don't poo-poo a, a, live, at, a live show, man, when yeah. you're yeah. playing live. And, you know, not to mention, you can just look at it as a, as a, as a dress rehearsal, as in a live, as a good live uh, practice. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, if there's nobody there, you're still practicing. You're with your bandmates. You're you're working on chops. You're doing what you love. So, what, so mm-hmm. what kind of what kind of gigs are are available <clears throat> for um, cover bands? Well, every gig is available for a cover band. I think. I mean, really, uh, cover bands. I think now in in the age of uh, the digital jukebox and the DJ, um, the cover band at this point probably is the most marketable to get steady work as a weekend warrior or even as a starting professional musician. So we get bars. You got bars. Got what? Corporate events. Yeah, you got corporate. Boy, if you can get in that corporate pipeline, <laughs> you're golden. 
weddings, weddings, um, festivals, festival. Yeah, you know, you get out especially and play. The local festivals. Are, yeah, local cool. festivals here and there, or even uh, private events. I private mean, there are opportunities events. to play like, somebody's backyard you know, personal party, private party, party, yeah, party yeah. Uh, bar mitzvah, yeah. whatever. Uh, you or know, you know, on, uh, those days when there's like a, a holiday, a local holiday, you know, Fourth of July or something like that, they're having some some you know music going on or something like that. Or or young musicians, you know, yeah. I think there's still markets. there's still opportunities to. You might even have to split it with a DJ, mm-hmm. but doing like your high school prom yeah. or something like that, you know, getting on with something like that is still c- kind of a cool thing. Uh, yeah. Starting yeah. starting with uh, battle of the bands type things or showcase gigs where. You get on and get the opportunity. I, I don't. I don't think anything substitutes for obviously practice one, but number two, playing live. Mm-hmm. And so, whatever opportunity you get, I think as a young musician and a young band, taking it and and running with it and try it. I think you know, playing live on a podcast would be pretty cool too. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> you can come play on a podcast. Yeah, That's pretty. Yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. Pretty too. great. <laughs> so, really, how would you approach then? Um, let's say you have a gig uh, coming up with a set list uh, coming up and we, we've, we've all played with different musicians playing different styles and where does one begin to say all right we have this gig what kind of songs are we going to play well i think it depends on one you know the the personality of your band and two the venue you know it's 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 tough if, if you're you know if you're a, a thrash metal band and you're trying to get a, a gig at the VFW Hall um, for their live music night. It might be a tough fit. So understanding maybe where you fit in with that. Um, but I, I think it's 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 infinitely important to go in with more songs than you think you might need, especially as a young band. Uh, think songs tend to go quickly. And you don't want to end up the night with repeating songs. And I, I did this in college. I was in a band who started playing open mics, and we had twenty songs, um, but we immediately got gigs. And then we had twenty five songs, and we literally played songs the first set, and we did four sets <laughs> because <laughs> it was some some ample breaks, uh, and had to replay songs again with the extended version because <laughs> we didn't have enough material. Uh, to play, so that that's actually a little. So that's a little technique or a little trick you can have in your pocket about having choosing um, or having certain songs that you know you're gonna extend, you know, uh, a solo section or extend, you know, the groove a little bit. And I think uh, one thing that's important not to worry about is just sticking to one type of music or one type of genre or whatever. I think a good variety is really important. You know, I mean, I think you got to mix it up as a cover band. You, one, you can show your versatility. Two, you can, you know, reach. Oh, somebody doesn't like this song, but you're going to play one a little bit later that they are going to like. You know, you're going to, you got to try to please the most people as possible when you're in a cover band. Yeah. You know, and so having a good variety to choose from for your set list. Each set list has to have a good variety. Or you can mix it up and say this set list is going to be like this. This next set list is going to be like this. I would say probably that would I would prefer a, a just a mixed up set list. You know, you can have some. I mean, you know, there's so many different types of danceable music. You can have your country. You can have like an R and B. You know, you can have some funk. You know, some hip hop, whatever, and just mix that up as a danceable one. You know, but I, I just think variety is important. Yeah, and because also you gotta keep this in mind too. There are a lot of event planners that they could just, you know, with one single thought say, okay, we need music, uh, sure, uh, let me find a DJ. You know, which is good for some situations, but, you know, the ultimate experience, I think, is to have a live band. You know, well, to... one, of, one of the most lucrative uh, experiences that I've been in is when I was in a band that hooked up with an event planner, mm-hmm. and she would literally call and say, we're having Cajun night, and we need you to play Cajun music and we'd say she said can you do that and we said of course (laughs) (laughs) it's always the answer it's always the the answer (laughs) is of course and then working working out a few Cajun songs and making maybe some of your regular cover songs more 
Cajun and uh, throwing Cajun out some, inspired, throwing out some beads in a hat, and uh, you know the the typical. Because the reality is, is that probably you know for that event planner, the folks from Blue Cross Blue Shield aren't really Cajun aficionados. They're just doing a Mardi Gras night, so they yeah. don't know the difference. Right. If you make Brown Eyed Girl somewhat Cajun and Bayouish, <laughs> black chicken, <laughs> black and chicken brown eyed girl. <laughs> That's a good point, though. Too right is like ex- in, for that exact situation. I mean, it would help. If you, you know, had an, an open mind with all the different genres and flavors and knowing how to execute that on your instrument. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and I, I think the the more versatile any musician is, the better they are in the long run for whatever is their true passion, you know, and coming back to it. And I and and that's hard. I think that's hard for young musicians in particular. You get into it and you're probably trying to emulate somebody at the beginning and you have an idea that that is quote unquote real music and so you you struggle with accepting that uh, this other genre of music is even valid um but it's somebody's art you know Mm -hmm. and and i think the the great latitude you have as a cover band versus a tribute band is to take that person's art and make it your art and I think people appreciate that. They appreciate, number one, hearing something that they recognize, but then they also can learn to appreciate your spin on that. And so it can be a kind of a win-win all the way around for both an audience and a musician. So, all right, having said all that and then having been talking about mostly cover bands this whole time, what is the the niche for a, a tribute band? When When is that? more um preferable i guess like what would be the situation where i'm going to decide i want to decide cover band or tribute band like oh you what, mean as from a musician's point yeah, of view yeah yeah from I, first from a musician's point of view and then the same type of things though like what applies to differently not being we, we should get some tribute band musicians in here <clears throat> probably to answer that mm-hmm. but i would think i mean you would really have to be into the music you know, I don't know. Yeah. I think I think there are also tribute band musicians who are just talented dudes, who or, or ladies who who uh, like to make money. Because I I see the more tribute bands at the local festival level, where you know maybe you have a two hour set, but you're making some pretty good scratch or a nice corporate event. Um, you know, Beatles tribute bands have been huge. Like Beatles tribute bands go all over and make yeah. bucks i think they make vegas cash. everything yeah. yeah they got big stuff yeah you guys want to start a tribute band <laughs> <laughs> i mean is it is it that a tribute band has the potential to be more lucrative than a, a cover band i don't for know the I, reason I, that it gives that experience of you know the real thing in a way i think there are more opportunities frankly for for cover bands because I mean, when you're when you're looking at a um, a tribute band, you're looking at a specific thing, you know, a specific uh, and or artist or experience. It's, it's a very very specific thing, and if it fits for your if you're I guess booking um, a show and it fits in that um, evening's vibe, yeah, it could work. But cover bands, I mean, it's it's almost like we were talking about. Oh, this event planner needs this type of music. You know, you're in a cover band who you have the the ability to play all kinds of uh, different things. You know, there's an opportunity for you right there. There's, well, you know, I think I think that either band, um, in the right situation, if you if you're just talking money, mm-hmm. you can make big money. I mean, I you know, those, there's cover bands who, you know, are strictly corporate or big money cover bands who have full horn sections and learn dance moves, and you know sometimes play to tracks and and uh stuff like that who are making great money uh, but maybe stray further from the originality being able to really kind of put their imprint on whatever song they're playing tribute bands um somewhat the same way you kind of lose your ability you know a lot of those tribute bands they're picking out and they're playing a note for note yeah uh, they're playing the solos exactly as they were and go so far as to even kind of lose some identity because they're literally dressing up like 
Robert Plant or Eddie Van Halen. Um, and so you kind of can lose your identity there, but it can be lucrative financially. Um, and I think that's always the struggle as a musician, as an artist, uh, of, of finding that balance between what is acceptable to you artistically versus what's going to pay some money. But, you know, there's also people out there <clears throat> who maybe feel more comfortable playing something that's not original, that might not be something that they wrote. You know, maybe they feel they don't like it or they're not comfortable with it or they don't, it just doesn't feel right. But whenever they emulate something that's already been done, they can really rock it out. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, like a classically trained like violinist or something mm -hmm. like that. They can, you, you put music right in front of them, they'll play it. But you ask them, hey, let's jam, let's do this tune in, you know, B flat or something. Right. And then they, they don't, uh, they're like, uh, just give me a piece of music so I can play it. You know, right. I mean, it, it might be the same kind of parallel uh, thing going on there with with somebody who's an, who, who might choose to be in a tribute band might just feel more comfortable playing something that's been kind of written and done and they can just do that and they can wail on it. You take, know? Your, take yourself back to maybe <clears throat> the some of the first gigs you ever played as a young musician. Was it like like for me personally, it was about like I'm playing in front of people, like I'm getting down, like this is it was so exhilarating, mm -hmm. it was so amazing. I don't I don't know that it made a huge difference what the content was. And I think when you're young, the great thing is you're choosing content simply that you love, mm -hmm. like that you're so into. So then the opportunity to play it out was so exhilarating um, that you're totally, and, and like, like I always felt like this, if, if as musicians, every gig we played, we could play like it was our first gig playing live, it would, <laughs> it would just be euphoric because it, uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but that's that's how it was for me. And my father is a musician, and I remember him at times going, "Oh, I got a gig tonight." And uh, you know, he played when he's playing in a cover band. Oh, I don't want to go and this and that. And I remember looking at him, going, "Like I would, I would give anything to go play in front of people right now and jam out and get down. I don't care what the music is. Mm -hmm. If I could go do it in front of people, I would do it. And uh, keeping that enthusiasm, I think is is huge for your well-being as an artist. Yeah. You know. Heck yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really yeah. good point. Yeah. All right, so let me ask you guys this. Would either of you be in a tribute band? And if so, what would that tribute band be? I w I personally would find it hard to be in a tribute band. You know, I mean to be committed for like to one band or one artist to emulate you know i mean I, I i think there's not enough hours in the day for me already you know if i'm going to play in a cover band for fun for money that's great with a good variety that's great but if i have extra time i mean i would pursue you know continue writing original music you know practicing more uh you know other things but to be dedicating that much for me i think it's a little too much i'd be spreading myself too thin and maybe I would probably lose interest. Would you do it, Rich? So you 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 would look at it almost like a job. Probably, yeah. Oh, it's eventually. definitely a job. I mean, would yeah. I would, would I do it? Yeah, I would. There's one band that I would be in a tribute band for. <laughs> Hold on, can uh, I guess? Can you guess? I, I think I guess. know. I'm gonna guess. Go ahead. It's gonna be. Uh, oh, gosh, because you guys have got no heavy metal. The band with the cool posters when we were kids. Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. but. It would not be drumming. I would be Steve Harris. I would be the bassist in an Iron Maiden tribute band. No question about it, dude. I would do that in a heartbeat. That would be the only tribute band that I can really think of that I would be like, all right, I would definitely do that <laughs> I for knew sure. It. I, knew I would it. definitely do an Iron Maiden. And, and, and I know that there are tribute bands out there. There's the Iron Maidens, the all girl right. tribute band that I, I would love to see them. But um, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. Even for all the I'm kids, not a bassist, but yeah. let's, let's, let's admit, like, if you grew up in the 80s, the coolest rock posters oh. were the Iron Maiden posters, okay? So. I had them all over the place. <laughs> all over what was the, the name of the character? Eddie. 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 Yeah. Oh, Eddie. Okay. He's still the man. Everybody, The kids still love Iron Maiden. They still do. You know, I mean, you'll see them walking around with their, with their you know, the shirts and everything like that. That's, that's good. It's called that's awesome. good parenting, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, if you that's see, right. kid, if you see exactly kids, right. yeah. I feel, exactly I feel right. bad. Because you're not going to find Iron Maiden just out there. He's you know? not a big Iron Maiden 
fan. Oh, I was not a big God. heavy metal fan. I would, I would, I would be in a heartbeat <laughs> if somebody called up, sent us on on, on you know on uh, tuneupandjam dot com email. <laughs> I, I think he's making the pitch. Right? We've Podcast lost. We've at lost. Tuneupandjam dot com. <laughs> Needing a bass player for an Iron Maiden tribute band. I will learn it. I do know some Steve Harris stuff. That's anyway, awesome. well, what I, about I, you, I, Chris? I, 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 I would, I would uh, consider Jimi Hendrix tribute mm-hmm. band because that's, you know, that's my end all be all. Would you want to sing it musically. too? You know, it, you I couldn't in it because mm-hmm. I could, I can't, I don't have the chops to play guitar in a Jimi Hendrix tribute band. Mm-hmm. Um, but but even just like playing bass, especially if we did a bunch of band of gypsy stuff, mm-hmm. I'd be down yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't mind doing full sets. Yeah. Well, that's cool. so like that's a little kinda miniature hip. tribute. That's yeah. kind of hip if you if, well, if you do. I can like, think a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, I can I think could, like Pink Floyd. I can think of. Metallica. Well, see, yeah, that's the I thing. If Rush, we if, you know, at gigs, if we did full sets of you know of anything like that, that's cool. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you dedicate the entire gig and then you know, trying to dial in every little nuance, it's a little much for me. But honestly, the best tribute band out there is Rush. Because they are their own tribute band. Yeah, they play everything live, note for note, exactly <laughs> the way they recorded it. I mean, they are spot on the best tribute band <laughs> and real band at the same time, like live. Anyway, so as we talk to to folks about going out and doing their own gigs, cover gigs or otherwise, mm-hmm. what do they got to get for gear? What do you think? I mean, what does every band have to have for personal gear to go out and do a gig? What do you think? Francis, what do you think? Well, there's a huge advantage to, I mean, aside from your own, well, let's talk, I'll, I'll speak from the guitarist's point of view. I mean, you know, obviously there's a lot of textures that you can get, a lot of colors you can get from the guitar, but first it really depends on the, the type of uh, uh, songs that you're going to play. You know, certain genres dictate certain um, textures in guitar, you know, certain sounds you'd get from pedals or multi-effects. I mean, guitarists, I guess it's pretty wide open, you know, everything from, you got the wall pedal, you know, you're going to have to have, play clean sound at some point, you're going to have to do some crunch at some point, um, so it really depends on that, but I would say, aside from your individual instrument, you know, it really helps for a band to have its own PA system. Can I ask you something as a guitar player? Yeah. If you got to have one pedal that's going to get you through the night for a cover gig, what is it? Well, I haven't really thought about that, but uh, if my amp has, if I'm getting my crunch from my amp, got my clean from my amp, I'd love to have the wah. Yeah, I, I can dig it. I love that. I, this is my favorite guitar effect. This is it? Oh, absolutely. All right, Rich. I mean, as a drummer, is there is there different? Do you do you should do you think different uh, setups for different gigs, or I mean? We, uh, or I mean, is it like we all think drums are drums? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably like that, but I'll try to I'll try to add something to it. I mean, obviously, just like anything, it depends on the situation and the style of music that you're playing and everything. Um, I, I keep it fairly small with mostly a four piece, you know, with drums, a uh, snare, two toms, and a kick drum. That's about it. A couple cymbals, but really, it's in the sticks. You know, you can you can choose different sticks. You can choose like uh, heavier sticks, lighter sticks, hot rods, um, some brushes. You know that that all brings something different to it. Also, I think what what a lot of people don't think of, but it's very important that you have some backup stuff. Like you, one of these days, are going to find yourself in a situation where your spring breaks on your kick pedal. You know, and to have like a backup pedal is really more important than the actual. I mean, you yeah. got to have stuff like that. You got to be ready in, in a case because that stuff is, you don't really think of it that much because that stuff is so durable and it lasts and, and it's just so tough. It I mean, goes through all kind of stuff. But every once in a while, something happens to one. It's, it's either the two big things the snare stand or the kick pedal. And, and to have a backup all the time with those things is yeah. really a big deal. We should yeah. do another episode on that because I, I have uh, my gig box. I have a box that would go to me with every gig, and it has just a variety of different things on that on that point. Dun, 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 but I mean, dun, dun, there's dun, dun. also <laughs> <laughs> Francis is <laughs> Inspector Gadget. Yeah, but I mean, there's also times when you might just. I mean, there are people out there who play the cajon, you know, yeah, and they don't yeah. even need a drum set or anything like that, or the bongos. I mean, it all depends on what you're. Whatever you're playing, you probably already have the equipment for already. So spare is a good idea, though. Uh, 
the case in point on uh last Saturday night we were playing a gig and my uh the bass that I was playing um had issues <laughs> let's hmm. say in the middle of a song and literally in the middle of the song yep. I had to quick flip off unplug and grab a different bass uh, that you know I had tuned up before and came in a few measures later back with the bass because you never know and that's a that's a great uh I think I think if you've played long enough everybody has a story of you know um taking you know I, for me I I'll, I'll relate to it taking the extra bass head because the um, we had a uh, you know whatever a twelve channel or an eight channel powered mixer that we literally fried during the gig, and taking my spare bass head and using it as a PA head and plugging <laughs> two microphones into it uh, because it had two inputs with nice. uh, and I just happened to have two XLR to quarter inch cords and using that. Got you through the gig. Got through the gig, and how to get through the gig when, when those things happen. So, you know, as you go out, you have to think of contingencies. Let's say you got, yep. and, and and you got to become a little bit of a MacGyver yep. ish uh, person because you don't have a guitar tech and necessarily a backline to go. Now, there's there's different gigs where where maybe you do have a PA or sometimes you even have a full backline, and you just got to show up with your instrument, and 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 that's great. Uh, but you you have to be prepared. Um, to be a little gearish yourself, so yeah, I feel an episode you know, coming. Learn yeah. <laughs> and you know, get yourself a good multimeter yeah. and uh, and uh, some spare cords and duct tape, yeah, or gaffer's tape, one of the two. You have that that can get you through some emergencies. How about um, just just simple advice to end the end it on, you know, protocol for gigs. What do you do? When do you show up? Do you show up early? Early. <laughs> early late you know what i i think everybody says early what's early uh, i personally think um an hour before uh downbeat is a, a good standard at least at least as, as at a least. drummer i go probably another 15 minutes before that yeah. just because i like to here's the thing protocol for setting up i mean it's really difficult as a drummer to be setting up mm -hmm. and other people are standing around trying to set up too so if you're a drummer, get there a little bit early and just be alone and take your time and get your stuff set up the way you want it to set up and the way you like it to set, have set up and not feel rushed about it. Because whenever everybody else starts showing up and starts bringing their stuff on stage, it gets to be a hassle. It's a pain. Sometimes the stages are really small or whatever. It might not even be a stage. It might just be some little corner and you just are, are you know, bumping into each other and, and you just get there early. You're going to not have any headaches. You're going to be set. You're going to be relaxed before the show. That's for, yeah. I, I, I say an hour for me because I probably could take 10 to 15 for a full setup. But that's because I've already, uh, my pedal board is, is configured in a way that it's a quick setup. I know the guitars. Um, I know the, the configuration of the amp. Everything is, is pre-planned so that when you're on the gig, you're not you know fiddling with so many knobs and you're basically just plugging it in. You know, marking your amp and, and for certain settings, and not to mention if you get there early enough, and you do all this stuff, and but you find you forgot something or you're missing something, you have time to figure something out. You know, figure uh, think, out this contingency. Stuff I, I think it's about. real important too to have that discussion as a band. Mm -hmm. You know, are you setting up the PA all together? Is there one guy who's the gear guy who's setting up the PA, and is he cool with setting it up by himself, or you are you rolling together? You know, as a bass player, like with my rig now and casters and everything else, I can roll in and set up in ten minutes and be ready to play. But right, well, so I, you can take my amp too. Am no. I being <laughs> you know, am I being relied on to set up the PA? Am I sound? Are we sound checking? These are things you need to talk about before you get there. And so, because yeah, otherwise, a people, great point. people yeah. can get real bent out of shape, and you can get. You know, if you show up 15 minutes before because you only need 10 minutes set up and everybody else has been in there hauling in your, you know, your uh, six foot tall with your two 18 inch folded subwoofers <laughs> and everything else. And they're like, uh, not cool. So it's a good discussion to have uh, before. The yeah. gig, at least. I, actually, I, to, to qualify this, I think, I mean, for me. It's an hour to those gigs that have the PA and stage and set up already. 
if it's going to be an outdoor um, event or it's going to be something where where you're requiring the PA setup, oh, much earlier. Yeah, absolutely. I, you you want to be ready when it's when it's jump time because at, at the at the at the very end of the day, um, whether you're getting paid or really whether even if you're not getting paid, you we are getting an opportunity. Uh, you know, you're doing it for a reason, and so. Be a professional about it. And you want future future yeah. gigs. So if you look professional for the people you're working for, whether for the venue, you know, you get there early, you're set up, you're prepared, you got your stuff in order, your ducks in line, and maybe you still have some time to go chat with them, you know, introduce yourself to them, get a little you know, that word gets passed along. You know, they might want you back or they might recommend you to somebody else. So all that stuff just comes into play. And speaking of that you know what, what what is your take on the whole request thing you know with, well, with, like i i, I you, you both it. know my my take on taking requests yeah no i think well we covered that earlier on and i think you know if you're at the gig trying to please the crowd as a cover band i think you do your best to take the request you know even if it's you know if 50% of the band kind of knows a song and just to kind of please this person and probably a, f- a few other people at least, you know, even if you do kind of a half jokingly, all right, we'll give it a shot and play like, you know, eight bars of it or something. Do like the that, Cajun might version. Be, yeah, <laughs> might be enough because I found that sometimes you do that, you play a quick chorus or whatever. And somebody might know, maybe even just the guitarist knows the, the couple of chords for the chorus right, right. And, then, and then they can sing the chorus. That person is usually happy with that, right, right? Right. They're usually happy. Hey, you know, I didn't think they were really gonna do my request, you know. And then they did it. They're impressed, and then maybe they stick around longer. Maybe <laughs> or at least they tried to do yeah, it. Yeah, they yeah. tried. So yeah. I mean, they'll appreciate that. You, you know? never know when that person who made the request is gonna come up and drop, you know, hundred bucks on each person exactly. in the band. Exactly. Or say, hey, you know what? I'd really love love you guys to go play. You know, yeah, this event that I'm having. Blah blah blah. You can dig it, but yeah. you also have to kind of also be aware of who you're playing with you know i think that's important too i think uh the three of us have played together for a long time and we're all pretty aware and we have pretty big ears and so we feel comfortable doing that um there are times also when maybe you know the song but if you you know if you know your the people that you're playing with well enough to go like this is going to be a train wreck then maybe you don't. <laughs> right. Or that's when you turn yeah. into an eight bar. All right, we'll do it real quick. Yeah. And then joking. All right, stop, stop, stop. We, you know, yeah. we, we did enough of that and we're not going to get any worse. But um, jump of... into the next thing, morph yeah. it into the next yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, this was fun. Is it time to go? Hey, do we need guests? No, I'm <laughs> I don't think we do. I think we're good on uh, our own. We do need guests. No. <laughs> oh, we love guests here. We love we love all our guests as we've had here. But we we do well together too. I think. Yeah, it, it, yeah. For the record, if you guys who don't know, we've known each other for a while. We actually <laughs> talk all kinds of stuff, you know, off the record. But we we can go on forever. We yeah, really could. Yeah, this was supposed to be like a ten minute talk here. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine the stuff that doesn't get recorded. So. Yeah, and all the edits that go into this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get the beep button down there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, we don't need it. We're pretty good. So uh, that wraps up, I guess, this episode, episode seven. It's nice to be back. It's nice to have this again. It's nice to see you guys in this in this uh, studio and having these little chats. It's fun. And thank you all for listening to us. Those of you out there who subscribe, thank you. And thank you for telling somebody else. If you can tell one person, that'd be awesome. We'd thank you very much. And uh, spread the word. You can find us on, uh, where can they find us? Twitter, Facebook. Yeah, all the good stuff. <clears throat> website, tuneupandjam.com. Tune up. Yeah, we're on iTunes as well. iTunes, subscribe to us, download it, listen to it, stream it, whatever you need to do. Uh, check us out. Yeah. Um, you can also email us, podcast at tuneupandjam.com. Oh, I want to say a personal uh, thank you to and shout out to Kevin and Karen who told me uh, last week that they listened to us. And so um, that, was really, that was really cool. That's great. I had no idea. Uh, and so thanks to them. And uh, I want to say hi, Val. And um, so uh, I think that's about it. Should we wrap this up here? Francis? That's it. See ya. <laughs> Later. Later. <laughs>